a, an association had to be formed to do the work, a nonprofit group like you have here. So in 1983, the Historic Fort Stillicum Association was founded to renovate these buildings and preserve them. At, so I went through the first president. Great soul. Yeah. <laughs> That's over the fireplace, you see how badly that's deteriorated. But notice also the split lath, they used hand split lath in that building, cedar lath. The other buildings have, uh, as I didn't change it, I'll do it again. The other buildings have uh, sod lath, which they probably got from the bird mill. All right, these are the, uh, some of the prime people who were involved in the renovation. Lyle Duncan was in charge of the, of the crew. He's done a lot of restoration work. And he's worked on the Bear Store in the early days. He's restored a number of houses and still have been, he's still building and he's way in his 80s. And he's, he's always going to be doing something. But there were many people who helped and donated the time. These are three of the main guys. Chuck Collier still works with us at the Florida Maintenance. And Jack Langston on the other side. He's getting a little old and not quite feeble, but he doesn't have much way to, uh, to get around. His wife has to be driving everywhere, so it's a little inconvenient for him. <coughs> I think a little sip of water here while the slides change. This is what we call quarters four. In the old days, uh, this was the um, um, Protestant um, chaplain's home, and also where he had services. Now, most of the soldiers at Fort Stilligan were immigrants. The majority were Irish Catholics. And this was a Protestant chaplain who wasn't there all the time. And he didn't get along very well with Colonel Casey either. And so the Catholics built a church. And we saw that in the, the other film, and it's still in existence today. When the fort closed, they took it down, piece by piece, in several sections, car carried it to Stelcom, and re-erected it next to the uh, Catholic nunnery in school. And that's where it is today. <clears throat> but this building, as you see, had all the porches were so bad, we had to tear them off and uh, reconstruct them from the beginning. A new roof was put on by the hospital, and you see a non-conforming structure in the back there that's being torn down. Well, when the hospital used these buildings, they added pieces here and pieces there, which were not part of the original structure, so we, we moved them. Because our interest is history of uh, the Fort Silicon era. <clears throat> Looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Did you have to put new siding on? Yes. Uh, well, they kept as much of the old siding as possible. They had to replace some of it. This illustrates uh, layers and layers of wallpaper. Now, the interesting thing is when they peeled this back, they could find where old stairways had been in the original. And so we put them back where they were, or where the windows were, or the doors were, because the hospital had moved these things. So we tried to put them back to their original location. And we, we got down to the original wood, the original paint. Where did you get the money, Orville? <clears throat> They, that, that's a good thing because that leads right into the next slide. <laughs> we obtained the money from uh, grants and donations. Uh, and the hospital did contribute some from their budget. Not a lot, but some. So almost all of this was uh, money that people gave to the restoration effort. But of course, even though that cost uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars overall, if you think about it. The most expensive thing was that labor. And those fellows worked, uh, some of them, as long as eight years full time to do that. Volunteer. <clears throat> well, we finally, <clears throat> in 1988, uh, were ready to commemorate the completion of the commanding officer's home. It's restored now, even down to the same color of paint that it was originally. And the ladies of the colonial dames 
um, decided that they wanted to participate in this dedication by uh, presenting a plaque to the uh, uh, association and put it on the house. Of course, they like to do that. They get some recognition as well. <clears throat> so this is what it looked like uh, when the state had its centennial in 18, I'm sorry, in 1989, 100 years yeah. celebration. Oh, I actually uh, went backwards. I pushed the wrong button. I didn't know it would go backwards. <laughs> As a recognition, um, the state of Washington um, gave our association president, as Jean Gardner, the uh, wife of the governor at that time, and Ralph Monroe, who's been there forever. And, you know, yes. <laughs> They presented a certificate, uh, a centennial award to the association that's being accepted by Lyle, who not only was the superintendent of construction, but he was also the president of the association at that time. Wow. Well, we really had more than one dedication, because as we finished the one building, dedicate that. So uh, State Senator Shirley Winsley came out to uh, help us dedicate quarters for that building you saw a little earlier stripped of its porches. Now you see how nice it looks. And of course, Lyle now is playing the part of the townsman from Stilton. Probably the mayor of Stilton. <coughs> which of course, you know, he was and went uh, for a good while. Let me see if I can get that slide to change. There it goes. Here it is. Gene Gardner returned for the dedication of our museum complex in 1990. But our featured speaker at that time was the man in the center there. Do you know who that is? Murray Morgan. Right. Murray Morgan, right. Murray Morgan right. an eminent uh, right. historian right. of Pierce right. County. Right. <clears throat> and um, 150 years after the establishment of the fort in 1849, and on August the 22nd, 1999, we held our sesquicentennial. Yes, yes. That's the 150 years, if you don't know what it means. <laughs> and we dedicated this um, plaque commemorating the um, establishment of the fort. And Company M uniform is for that one gentleman who was wearing uh -huh. the, the lighter blue. Yeah. And that happens to be a cannon barrel on the top of, the, of that. And uh, Steve Dunkelberg, person who was organizing that event, so you all know Steve. Yeah. To, uh, today the fort has a new mission. We completed the restoration, so now we um, are trying to educate people and tell people the history of the fort and of that era of um, time that was important to the Pacific Northwest. You know, the Fort Silicon was the primary supply evil of the Puget Sound area, uh, as long as it listed, lasted. So we are interpreting that history in quarters four. We call that now our interpretive center, and have a number of uh, displays. Um, you'll notice that dior diorama was built by one of our members. It shows the fort as it was. Now we also are collecting artifacts, um, or sometimes get them on loan. This is an exhibit of surgical medical instruments used during the Civil War period. And uh, we had a fellow demonstrating how they sawed off a leg and it looked pretty gory. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're, we're, we can be fortunate that we didn't live during that period and get through the Civil War with a wound in our leg. <clears throat> we also, since we are a fort of the Civil War era, though we weren't uh, involved in the Civil War itself, um, we acquired some cannons from the city of Olympia. These cannons were made during the Civil War, uh, but they were just the barrels, not the carriages. So we got a grant together and commissioned the construction 
of these carriages. We built, had three of them built in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, by a man who specializes in this kind of work. So this is his shop in Pennsylvania. And they finally arrived, and we mounted them. These cannons, you see what they look like there? They were down in Priest Point Park in Olympia, and they were being vandalized. The kids had thrown them over the cliff and, you know, and whatever, so they were very glad to put them in our custody. It's an indefinite loan. Uh, but it's found the best home. Yeah, that's great. And here they're doing the final adjustments on them, and uh, you can see them in our cannon shelter, which was built um, just for the purpose of housing them. Have you ever fired them? Um, no, we haven't fired these. These are called Napoleons. Yeah. Um, uh, they're made of brass. Um, and uh, this cannon shelter that they're in is about where the magazine was in the early days. You know, a magazine is where they keep all their ammunition. And uh, as you saw in the film earlier, the magazine had a number of cannon out in front of it. It had a tin roof on it so that if sparks came from a fire, uh, it wouldn't burn them down and explode the whole thing. <laughs> Yes, they're changed down. <laughs> Even though they'd be hard, hard to move, you'd be surprised when people move. I know, yes, I'm thinking of that. <clears throat> our docents are really a very important part of our education program. That's Lou Duncan, by the way. And, um, uh, How do you train them? Uh, we do have uh, docent training programs every once in a while. We had an extensive one which uh, we presented a good deal of, um, of information uh, about history as well. One of my favorite docents was Mary Metzler, who is now retired from our organization. Um, she knew so much about uh, all of the artifacts in the buildings. And she is showing now a sewing cabinet in, in uh, Corners One. We also have a school outreach program. You know, that's where education is really important. If you get your children interested in history and preserving history, maybe they won't destroy things because it's old. I know because I'm a, I'm a former teacher. And uh, um, my favorite way to teach was the fifth grade. And we did a lot in local history. We wrote a book. We explored and the kids uh, entered their stories in the Fort Vancouver Historical Society's History Writing Contest. And every year they got first place, they got the plaque. Uh, for the six years that we edited it, so I was always very proud of those kids. And, um, and they really, to this day, appreciate history, our local history. And here Christine is also a teacher, and she's working with these children to teach them uh, uh, something about weaving as part of our outreach, school outreach program. Did the boys weave too? Oh, yes. Oh yes, I think see, one's a boy, I, I, I don't know if it is or not, I can't tell. They're all wearing different hats on I see a straw hat. Uh -huh. And uh, Tom Melberg is one of our reenactors. Here he is impersonating Captain Hunt, Lewis Hunt, who married the daughter of Colonel Casey. Uh, her name is Addie. And uh, matter of fact, there were two weddings uh, on that property that time. Um, uh, the descendants of uh, Abby Casey and uh, Lewis Cass Hunt still live in Washington. Um, one of the descendants came to our sesquicentennial uh, celebration from Spokane. And she is corresponding with us and giving us a lot of uh, her family history relating to uh, people of interest that uh, were important at Fort Silicon. 